Now we're going to get into state specific coordination and what different states have been doing operationally. And so our first speaker um, is uh, Mr. Frank Buccello with uh, New York Ag and Markets. Uh, Frank is the Spotted Lanternfly Program Survey Coordinator uh, for New York Ag and Markets. So welcome, Frank. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Let me we can share a screen here. We'll get you up on. Uh, one second here. I'm oh, sorry, one moment. I can't seem to get this the button correct. Hi, Frank. If you hit F5, it should work. Okay, thank you for that. Now we're good now, Frank. That's okay, good. great. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, and just uh, moving along, and Frank Richel in New York State Ag and Markets uh, to give an overview of what has happened in the last year and what we're planning to do. And as Chris Loeb mentioned yesterday uh, about comparing it to a sort of rogue wave. And that's kind of exactly what happened to us in this last season. Just an overview of our confirmed populations you can see here, uh, starting from west going down east and south. We have the Ithaca infestation and the concern for this one is this is right on Cayuga Lake, part of the Finger Lakes, again, gateway to the Finger Lakes region. That's a very important area to New York agriculture. We have a lot of orchards and vineyards up in that area. The current area we're working on is just below that, is in Binghamton. This is another area where transportation methods are involved. You can see we have an Interstate 88 going from the northeast going down southwest. You have 81 going north and south, 86 going east and west. It's, it's a major hub for the interstate routes there. Moving further south, then we have our Port Jervis infestation right at the intersection of Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, and also Route 84. And the interstates, every, everything that's going on here is going to be involved with major transportation routes. Uh, also in that Port Jervis area, there's also some state forests, nature trails where the infestation seems to have, was located and parking lots, uh, again, all relating back to transportation. Moving further south, we have this here is the Hudson Valley. The northernmost part we have, an, uh, not a known infestation in Highland, but we've discovered some life stages of the insect there. Moving further down is Newburgh, and this one was initially found at a truck stop right off of Interstate 84, which you can see comes in from Massachusetts through Connecticut right to New York and then into Pennsylvania, another interstate route. Then we have Slotesburg, which was a truck stop on the New York State Thruway. Don't have to say more than that. Orangeburg, right at the border of New Jersey, New York, another state route going uh, between the two states. Then a more recent one in right on the county, uh, the state line, excuse me, of Connecticut and New York by Westchester County Airport. Then the other ones that are of a major concern to us now on Long Island in Nassau County and Suffolk County, we have these infestations that are major. The concern here is the east end of Long Island again is a very big agricultural area for New York State. We have orchards, vineyards, and farms. Just going into a little detail on each one of them. This is the Ithaca infestation. In Ithaca, last year, early in the season, we found 
egg masses, scraped all the egg masses, and actually performed the tree removal in that area. Uh, once the tree removal was done, the remaining wood was chipped. The piles of chips were monitored to make sure nothing ever survived. And then the area was also treated with bifenthrin. There were no positives, no adults have been found, although a single egg mass has been found this year. So obviously monitoring it very carefully to make sure it doesn't expand or what, if anything is found, we can control it easily enough. We had a lot of cooperation with Ithaca. Ithaca Forestry was a, a major help in this area. And as I mentioned earlier, this is Cayuga Lake, one of the Finger Lakes. So this is a major concern area. We have to try and control it here. The most recent area we've been working with uh, south of Ithaca is in the Binghamton area. Uh, you can see Route 80, Interstate 81 is going right across. Um, going east to west, this is 8617. And just up here, you'll, you can't see it on this map, but another Interstate 88 goes northeast up towards the Albany area. These pinkish red areas are the quarter mile buffer zones and the yellow ones are the half mile buffer zones. So we're inspecting everything within this area. We just came back from a two week intensive survey in that area. And to date, over 2000 egg masses have been removed. Uh, we're going property to property doing a 100% survey in preparation for treatments. Unfortunately, we got a little slowed down uh, when we were up there. The weather didn't always cooperate with us. There was a snow cover, ice cover, and a uh, number of the mornings, the temperatures started out at five degrees and a lot of our electronics weren't working correctly, but we managed to get a big chunk of that work accomplished and finished. Just west of this area is uh, Owego, New York, and our PPQ partners have been working there. Uh, checking those areas. No, nothing has been found in that area, but they're still checking our, our, my, a number of parcels. The other concern in this area, and you'll see it coming in, it's been mentioned before, if you can see it on this map, there's a rail line right through here, and there are multiple tracks here. Every time you go to that area, you'll see hundreds of freight cars just parked there waiting. Again, another major transportation area did it come from the railroad? Did it come from the interstates? At this point, it's still unknown, but that's the common denominator. Moving down to Port Jervis, again, this is the tri-state area, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Route 84. It's an interstate coming from, starting in Massachusetts, coming straight into Pennsylvania. And you can see all these, again, same thing, quarter mile and half mile. The odd thing about Port Jervis was in this area here, we found one egg mass prior to last summer, but that particular summer, we, there's a, I would say uh, 500 egg masses this year, but thousands of adults were killed through a combination of trapping. And we were able, the Lower Hudson Prison was able to do a basal bark spray on the trees. So between the basal box spray treatment and our traps, well over 2,000 adults were killed. And uh, I, what I can't say is it was the first time uh, our team experienced the, the honeydew rain. It was a very uh, interesting experience, but that's the numbers in the trees were really that high that it kind of surprised us. The odd part was further down in the city itself where we had found numerous egg masses, the number of adults were not as much as we found were the previous areas. So again, just moving along the lines here, these are state forests, nature trails, hiking trails. Each one of these, the egg masses and adults were found at the trailheads in the parking lots. Okay, the latest one, and this is another one of uh, more recent concern. This is Newburgh, and this area here, the first pink circle, the infestation was found at a truck stop. The trucks were backing right up to a woodlot. That woodlot was completely infested. Uh, we did have a spray treatment in that area, and we had uh, trapping. It was 
seemed successful. Uh, unfortunately, we're finding more infestations further east and going towards the south. The concern again for this area is this is Interstate 84 going east to west. This is Interstate 87 going north to south. And if you can see on the map right here is Stewart International Airport, another concern because of the uh, import export businesses going on. And uh, thankfully we have our, our PPQ partners are working on that area, getting the contacts, getting permissions and ready to go in and, and inspect that area to make sure that we have some type of an idea, has it, is it spreading or keep it from getting into the actual airport properties. And unfortunately, further east again, right on the Hudson, adults were found in this area, not a major find, but it's of a concern because it was found right across from a, an oil distribution center. It's uh, Route 9W north, south, and a freight line uh, for the railroads moving north and south. Also, there are businesses right along the river that are getting shipments via barge coming up from anywhere south of Staten Island, further south in New York, down in New Jersey, further down the coast. So another concern is how is it getting there? There are many methods of transportation, how the insect is starting to hitchhike there. In Long Island, this is another one of our major areas of concern because this is the gateway towards the east end. The east end of the island, North Fork, South Fork, and this area here is the agricultural area of Long Island. Farms, orchards, major vineyards. So our concern is keeping it from expanding further out. Unfortunately, right here at the Nassau County, Suffolk County line, uh, there's a power line right of way just north of some cemeteries where PPQ has been working. And to date, over 7,000 egg masses have been found and destroyed. So the concern on that is it's right by a north-south trucking route, Route 110. Again, an interstate 495 along the expressway is right next to it, and it goes straight out into the farm agricultural area. A little further south from that, again, along the county line, Amityville, Massapequa, and so on, we have these other smaller infestations. And I use the word smaller and just to describe the size of the map, they are infestations that we are working on. Excuse me. Moving further east in this Ronkonkoma area, this is actually Bohemia and it's the Islip MacArthur Airport. There's another major infestation at this area. And the concern again is there's a major trucking route, Sunrise Highway on the south, 495 on the north, 347 going east to west. A lot of businesses, it's an industrial area. A lot of freight passes through here and hundreds of egg masses also found in this area. And this is where we're hoping to get a very strong treatment program going to control it, trapping, preventing any movement further east, or at least being able to slow it down before it gets to the, the vineyards and the orchards, or the, the areas that we really are concerned with at that point. And another area of importance, the Lower Hudson Valley has a number of orchards and vineyards. It's, it's another important area. Unfortunately, though, we're finding infestations up and down that part of the Hudson Valley. So in those areas, we are trying to spend as much time as we can and uh, use our efforts to be put there to the, the point that we can. Okay, our current efforts, again, we're still performing our ground surveys. We're not stopping. We have a lot more to go. As I mentioned earlier, Binghamton, we had some really severe uh, Weather conditions, we got through as much as we can. We, we accomplished quite a bit, but we're going to have to go back once the snow and ice you know, recedes so we can get a better look at the properties, the trees, to see if there are any egg masses we missed and to get treatment releases so we can prepare for treatment there also. Our outreach is continuing on a regular basis. Uh, just as this summit, a lot of the speaking engagements we had turned to virtual engagements, and that's been 
working very well. We're getting a lot of outreach towards Western New York, uh, the Eastern part of Long Island. Everybody that needs to know about it, we're being able to provide them with information and, and allow them to see what we're doing. Uh, just wanted to give it a shout out. We have you know, Long Island, excuse me, Lower Hudson Prism and the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference have conservation dogs that have been working with us for a number of years now. And if you have uh, access to any of these type of animals, the animals are incredible. They have found so many egg masses or life stages that human inspectors could not find. You could see that they're able to check a lot more carefully on vehicles, when we're in the woodlots or on the properties, it's easier for them to pick up the scent of something that's hidden from, from us, the human inspectors. But just shout out to Dia and Josh, the handler in the left and center photo and Fagan and the, the photo on the right. Invaluable amount of help from the prisms and the trail conference. Okay, as we did and started this uh, last year, we have a multi-agency uh, meetings bi-weekly during the season, during the, the heart of winter, it was uh, monthly, but we it's a multi-agency approach statewide. PPQ is, is a partner in New York State DEC, the state and city DOTs, state and city parks, housing authorities for the city, the Department of Environmental Protection. It's working together. It, we're able to share a lot of the data. Everybody can see what is being accomplished. We don't step on each other's toes and it works extremely well as a unit. Everybody knows where everybody is. Places where one agency can't reach, another agency is able to get out there and place traps or uh, as in the last bullet point, an asset inventory. It, it, it allows each agency, one agency, may require certain equipment that they don't have, another agency has it. So we will rely on them to provide for that particular need. And it has worked very well over the last few years. Everybody's cooperating with each other. We, together, we're able to accomplish more than any one of us could have done individually and really appreciate all that. You know, uh, you've seen some of the other presenters use the citizen scientists for getting the public involved. Uh, they can use IMAP invasives to put any information in, uh, having extra sets of eyes in these areas that any of our agency inspectors can't get to is definitely being a big help. Still offering online training webinars for the public so that they can understand how to use this and get us more information. So again, together working as one unit, we know where everything is. So a lot more eyes out there seeing what's going on. Uh, the PRISMS, Partnerships for Regional Invasive Species Management. Uh, they again, invaluable help. They're reporting, they're monitoring, they're taking some of the grids when we assign grids for survey, they're taking chunks of it, they're going out there with, with their people and able to identify areas that, okay, this area is not a concern, it'll allow us to spend more time concentrating on the agricultural areas of importance. Again, just continuing on, same, waiting for the weather to abate a little bit uh, in the areas that is uh, affecting us, continue our multi-agency approach. And trapping, obviously we're gonna be doing a lot more trapping than we did last year, uh, well, over, well over 500, close to 700 traps I can foresee setting out as a combination of both detection and to, Try to use it as a population control, knock down the populations closer to the agricultural areas. Uh, considering using you know, the management tools, where to allocate the funds and the personnel, how to best attack this, constantly reassessing our situations and then seeing where action is needed. Uh, the regulatory packages can constantly being studied. Is it being updated? Does it need to be updated? How are we updating it? Everything is still being worked on. And as time goes on and we see the situation change, it'll be addressed. And that's mostly it's 
all that's going on in New York State, and it's a lot. Uh, we're dealing with it, and as I keep saying, working with our MAC partners, it's the cooperation and assistance is invaluable. Cornell, New York State, IPM, Northeast IPM, again, the amount of help they've been able to offer is, is just, we're grateful for it. It was really good. And as I did last year, I want to thank the New Jersey Spot Atlantifly program. Any questions we ever have or any advice that we seek from them, they're always very happy to assist us and help us. And thank you, New Jersey, again, for, for all your help you've provided in the last year. And my contact information, anybody needs to contact, uh, would like to contact me, get some further details or any questions at all, feel free to just send me an email, give me a call. Uh, Ethan Angel, the field operations manager, also very, you know, he can also assist if I'm not available. And that uh, about wraps it up. Thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate it. All right, thanks, Frank. I appreciate it. A lot of good information there. You did have a few questions. Um, were there any tree removals done at the Conklin Binghamton site today? No, but that, that particular area, we have not done any removals on that yet. It's, it may be under consideration that we were working with the uh, Broome County Parks, Binghamton Parks, uh, and the, the towns. It's actually four, excuse me, three different uh, municipalities involved with the area that's infested. So they're the three different parks, departments, and DPWs that we have to work with. Okay. Um, okay, there, well, this isn't really a, a question or it kind of is a question. So Audrey uh, is looking to, or if you're looking for volunteers to assist with egg mass searching and destroying in any of these areas, I guess Audrey is uh, offering maybe to assist you in that. So yeah. um, if you wanna go to the Q&A, then Audrey, you can reach out to Frank. He gave his information. So you could reach out to Frank and, and talk about that on the side. Um, are there protocols on training detector dogs? Or, or would that be covered? Is that something that's gonna get covered later? So. Frank, do you have any information on training detector dogs from the picture from the? Well, as I said, the, the, the conservation dogs were actually from the New York, New Jersey trail conference. So that would be where the information would come. We use their services. I'm not familiar with the, the training uh, protocols. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if Joy's gonna get into that. Maybe she will, but uh, I can also tell you um, you can reach out to PPQ and, you know, we can share, certainly talk about training protocols. And then Dana uh, had Pennsylvania also has training protocols of their, for their dog, Lucky. So there's several people on the call that probably could get that answer from. Right. Okay. When was the second Hudson River area Newburgh infestation found? It was actually, it was last year, 20, 2021. Uh, it was found in the, the truck stop, if I remember correctly, it was actually a PPQ trap that found the first adult and the last, yes, it was last year. So it was last summer of 2021. And that's when we started uh, doing combined in, inspections in that area. Okay. What is the furthest north you are seeing reproducing populations? Anything upstate with really cold winters? Other than Ithaca is probably the furthest north with a, an active, we, where we had egg masses, like a full life cycle. Uh, the other area further, furthest north would be Highland, which is right across from Poughkeepsie, but that we only found adults. We have not yet found egg masses. So Newburgh and Ithaca seem to be the furthest north as of this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and then one more, what were the predominant species of trees that were removed? I guess they're talking about in the Ithaca oh, area. In the Ithaca area. Oh, that's, 
there were quite a number of uh, maples in the woodlot that was taken down. So it was a, mostly a mix of ailanthus and maples. It was a, an area in uh, next to like a college residence, uh, apartment buildings. So the, the woodlots weren't very well kept. Uh, it, it was almost as if they didn't mind that we had uh, trees removed because it actually made the neighborhood look better. But most of it did seem to be uh, maple and uh, ailanthus. Okay. And I think that's all the questions that I can see, Frank. Thanks again for your time and for the information. Okay, thank you very much. All right. And so next we have uh, from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, uh, Ms. Tina McIntyre. Tina is the state survey coordinator for Virginia. Hi, thank you for the invitation. And can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thanks, Tina. Cool. Um, yes, my subtitle for this uh, talk is the year of the great spread in Virginia, but it sounds like it could be the year of the great spread for um, the uh, Eastern um, seaboard actually. <laughs> so um, this is the population in Virginia at, at positive sites as it stands now. Um, we have 15 jurisdictions that have spotted lanternfly reproducing um, populations in them at this time. In 2018, we ended up the year with six square miles in our program, and now we're up to 232 square miles. Uh, we figured out that um, this was a 3,766% increase um, in just four years. I don't know how realistic or practical that number is. Uh, um, what really is a, a little bit alarming to me is this increase from the uh, 147 square miles to the 232 square miles. That's nearly a 50% increase and doubles our treatment area. Uh, for 2022, and I'm quite sure that's not the end of the spread, but um, it is quite alarming uh, to us that we have to face that. Um, I feel for everybody in Pennsylvania. Um, this is uh, one of the challenges that we are faced with every year, as is everybody. Um, it's the railroads. This is an illustration of just one of these situations. We have many in the state. And, um, in uh, October 2021, we had these positives right along this railroad track in the town of Shenandoah. And post October 2021, we did see spread occur, even though we were treating where we could treat. We did not have access to the railroad right away, and we're pretty confident that's what uh, ex can explain the spread. Um, we did have a staffing challenge and we still are having a staffing challenge as I, I think a lot of other places are too for this year. Uh, we do have one full-time uh, supervisory position um, and six wage positions approved. And currently we just have six uh, or three wage positions filled. And here's my shameless plug. At this moment in time, spotted, our spotted lantern fly field supervisor job is posted. And if you go to jobsvirginia.gov, if you're interested in working with spotted lantern fly in beautiful uh, Virginia, uh, please feel free to fill that uh, job application out. It closes March 9th. Uh, we do hope with, if we do get increased funding for uh, the 2022 season that we can increase our staff and spread them out um, statewide instead of concentrating them in the Winchester area. Um, so now what I'd like to turn um, our attention to is a specific project that occurred in Virginia in 2021. It was a challenge in Prince William County that was uh, a wetlands. Um, this is where Prince William County is located in Virginia, very close to the DC area. And also the Potomac River runs right through, through here. Um, it, it, 
in um, March of 2021, we were late March of 2021, we were informed by the Prince William County forestry staff that right um, below the, um, the commuter rail station, the Virginia rail line, uh, there was a positive SLF site. So through Mar April, um, a lot of staff came in and started doing surveys in here. And um, we found nine positive sites out of the 21, 20, 29 surveys we did. Uh, the challenge in this area is that we have this beautiful broad run that goes directly to the Potomac River. And we had this uh, elevated railroad station, elevated railroad track, elevated parking area um, for construction site business and an elevated road. So all the water that drained from these two areas sat and collected um, right where the positive uh, find was. And we had a positive find on this side of the road too. So we were limited through the um, environmental assessment of what, what we could actually do in these areas. So we turned to the science and technology team and they came to the rescue, thank goodness for them. And there was a lot of suggestions that came out of the call we had, uh, mass trapping being one of them. And then USDA Environmental Services in the form of Kai, he came down and identified the wetland boundaries so that we knew exactly where we could do things and where we could not to keep us out of trouble. Um, and then uh, Phil Lewis suggested possible tree injections. And you saw earlier today that the tree injections have a lot of, um, a lot of good reasons to use them. The reason why they were suggested for the wetlands is it's a closed system um, and the material is directly um, injected into the trunk of the tree. So there's no way that there could be environmental drift um, as you might get a little bit with a, bark, a basal bark treatment. Um, we also uh, were, uh, can, we also considered a sentinel tree system around this area. Um, so on March 15th, that was our mass trapping day and staff from all over the place um, came and helped. There was a huge contingency from um, USDA, which we really appreciated the support that they gave us for this day. Um, but lots of different organizations jumped in to help us set traps. Uh, we set 140 traps that day, plus there were 60 already set. So we ended up with uh, 200 traps uh, in and around this uh, wetlands area. There's our crew. We did have a nice day, which was great. And uh, uh, here's our fearless leader, Matt. He was there. Um, this is an example of the situation that we were trapping in. Um, these white marks that you can kind of see down the trail, this is, these were our, uh, some of our traps. And this is an example of the elevated area where the tracks went up. And this is where that paved parking lot was. And you can kind of see how the grade just dumps water right down this path. Um, and this map on the right-hand side is um, where all our traps uh, were set. Um, we did have, uh, Phil came down and trained USDA and VDACS staff on uh, tree injections in May. And uh, anybody that wanted to get their hands on the equipment and inject a tree with, was able to. Phil was very generous with his time and his equipment and allowed us all to become injection experts. Um, so here's the actions that were taken at this site. We, uh, uh, USDA treated, uh, with dinoteferon basal bark treatments outside of the wet designated wetlands. Um, inside the designated wetlands, we injected 29 trees with dinocide, which is um, dinoteferon. Both of these are dinoteferon. And then um, we uh, applied three gallons of bifedrin um, in that area. I think USDA did all of that, actually. I don't think uh, BDACS did. And then we um, ended up setting 202 circle traps and 10 sentinel traps. And the sentinel traps were a half a mile and a mile out in all directions. So the total number of SLF killed in our traps was at least 5,000 nymphs and adults. And we 
uh, found and destroyed 813 egg messes that were in association with the traps. Um, and so we figure if you multiply that out, that's about 16,000 um, egg masses that the traps were related to killing. So that's like 21 or so uh, thousand insects that the mass trapping uh, effort kept from um, becoming viable SLF for 2022. Um, we did not have a way to really figure out how many uh, insects the, um, the sprays actually killed. That is the result of the mass trapping. And then um, at, at our mass trapping locations, there were out of the 200, there were 89 that actually had egg masses associated with them. And so we started with nine positive locations and we ended up with 89 positive locations. Um, did we slow, slow the spread with this effort? Um, hard, to, hard to tell, but my suspicion is that we, we did have an impact, if not completely stopping the spread. So pre-October uh, 1st, 2021, this is what our map looked like. We had, this is the um, train station where we mass trapped. This is a positive site along some railroad tracks um, that was found a little bit later in 2021. And again, along the railroad tracks, another uh, set of positive sites north. So as of 2022, this is what Prince William County now looks like for positive sites. And um, you can see that we had one more site found um, along the railroad track here. Uh, this. This is about three miles away from our mass trapping effort. And this site down here on 95 is a rest area. So I don't think this is related in any way to this population. It just was uh, probably introduced off of a car at that rest area. Um, this is about a mile away from our regular, uh, from our original mass area. Uh, if we expand this cluster so we can see it a little better, uh, this spot right here is that spot. So we're about a mile away from our, our original area. This is about a mile away from our original area. Both of these sites were uh, had zeros um, at the beginning of this project. Um, this, this and this site are all about a half a mile away maybe a little bit more for that one. Um, this is one of our sentinel traps. Out of the 10 sentinel traps that were set by USDA, this is the only one that was positive. So it's my feeling that if I look at the map of Shenandoah along that railroad track and the spread that we saw there, that th we did hold back the spread here with all of the efforts that were combined um, with everything that we did in that one area. Um, luckily for us, that VRE station, that, that Norfolk Southern VRE railroad line was um, on county, renting county property. So we did not, we weren't able to work directly in the train right away, but we got so close to that train track because of the, because of the um, county uh, owning it, that it really helped us uh, with our efforts right up against the tracks. So it was nice that this particular situation, we didn't have a lot of trees outside of our, of our, our agreement with the county. There were some, but it wasn't very many. Um, so in conclusion, it takes a village for mass trapping effort. There's no way that just the Virginia USDA and VDACS staff could have placed all those traps and maintained them. Um, it takes a full toolbox too. Um, we could not, if we had just attempted the mass trapping effort, we would not have uh, had this uh, result, I, don't, I do not believe. Um, the injections worked. They worked really quickly and the material moved through the canopy more efficiently and effectively than the basal bark sprays. We could see that in this, uh, that dead uh, spotted lanternfly were falling out of the tops of the tree heaven that were injected. 
and um, not out of some of the trees that were uh, treated with the basal bark sprays. So we're firm believers in the injections and we would highly recommend including them into the EA. However, I talked to Matt last night and, or two nights ago, and it doesn't sound like that might work. The only reason that we were able to use them in this situation is because we've got, we had an exception. It was, it's not called an exception, Matt, you'll have to clarify that, but um, we had, we were allowed to treat within, it had to be under 10 acres, um, that we were allowed to work injections into this. So um, definitely would like to see them added in if it could be. And just to, um, at the last part of this, uh, when Kai came down and marked the wetlands, he used these red ribbons. So it was really clear when we were inside the wetlands area and outside the wetlands area. So uh, uh, thank you, Kai, for that. And this is just a shot of the Virginia bluebells along this, um, Broad Creek in the area that we were working and why it's so important that we do protect and take measures to not, po not uh, poison the environment that we're working in. So thanks to the science and technology team and to USDA and all the effort they put into this. And I can, I, I, am, I think that's it, I'm done, uh, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Tina. I appreciate it. Um, I don't see any questions. Just uh, one thing, just um, a point of clarification. So the environmental assessment includes injection only for imidacloprid. Um, it doesn't include dinotefuran injections. So that is a point of just clarification for everyone. Um, and as Tina said, you know, this was kind of an exception uh, based on this site that was able that we are able to make based on the, the high water table and the wetland nature of this of this site. So, um, so Matt, thanks for pointing that out. We did consider going to a metaphorid because it was in the EA, and after talking to Phil, um, he basically said that the amount of a metaphorid in the leaves. Uh, or in the in the tissue samples when he did the testing with it was the effectiveness was so much less than the dinocide that he recommended that we stick with the dinocide. Right. Yep. So Tina, I don't see any questions right now that I can see in the chat. Hold on a second, let me look. And may I must say that the app that um, all the maps that I had shown, except for the very first one, came from the app that Liz was describing for Virginia. So it's up and running and working really well. Uh, thanks, Great. Liz. Great. All right. Yeah, I don't see any questions, Tina, right now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to speak. So our next uh, presentation um, is by is uh, by Dave Atkins. Dave is uh, the Agricultural In Inspection Coordinator for the Ohio Department of Agriculture. Dave, are you on? Don't see him at the moment. All right, I don't see Dave. What we can do is, uh, James Watson, are you on James? Just promoted Dave to a panelist, so he should be getting on. Okay. There he is, Dave. Dave, Dave Atkins. Can you hear me? I can hear you. 
Okay, here we, we go. We are ready for yes, sir. We are ready. I can't. There we go. Okay. Oh, where did I get that background at? <laughs> Sorry about that. Must have been my last uh, Zoom meeting. VA uh, uh, was waiting and expecting spotted lanternfly back in 2020. So, uh, being that we had no money at the time uh, to really attack this thing, we decided to put together a cooperative group uh, of different agencies uh, throughout the state. Uh, this involved ODA, uh, the APHIS, state APHIS office, PPQ, our Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, Ohio State University Extension Office. We got them involved. We also got the Metro Park Systems involved. Uh, and the most important group uh, that got involved with us was the Ohio Grape and Wine Industry Association. Uh, they've been very active with us and, and interested in what we've uh, been doing. So what we do with this group is we meet every couple weeks and discuss what's going on, what needs to go on uh, as far as outreach. Outreach has been very important for us and has been the key to how we've been finding our uh, infestation sites. Uh, we've got four infestation sites and all of them were reported uh, by citizens who have been, uh, who had attended an outreach training program on uh, spotted lanternfly and so forth. So uh, outreach is the most important uh, aspect of our program and making sure the people, more boots on the ground uh, with the citizens uh, to help report. So that's been very good. We've done, what we do here in Ohio is we do some trap, circle traps placements. We did about a hundred traps last year, looking to do about 200 this year. Uh, we do visual surveys as well. Once a report comes in, we ask people to report to us uh, what they're finding send us a picture, send us a sample so that we can um, verify before we make the run out to, uh, to search. We get a lot of hitchhikers uh, situations uh, that uh, people have gone to the East Coast to visit relatives and so forth and come back home. And then all of a sudden the next day they see a spot of lantern fly in their vehicle or, or next to their vehicle or in their yard. So uh, we go investigate these situations. Usually don't find anything when it's a single uh, insect. It's, uh, it's not established, so it makes it very hard to determine if there's anything really going on until we give, a, give it a year or so. And then we'll go back and take a look and see if anything has developed on that aspect. Uh, we don't, haven't done any central trees uh treatments or anything like that it's just been mainly the circle traps that we utilize um each agency had at the time we got together uh we all have our own little data uh, collection uh we're using here at oda uh, uh survey one two three osu has the uh, great lakes early detection system uh, that they use. And then of course, APHIS had their collector and now field maps. Uh, so, but we've got a good GIS specialist here at ODA that uh, collects the data from uh, Great Lakes and our uh, survey one, two, three, and then submits that information into the uh, APHIS database. Uh, we didn't want, uh, uh, didn't force anyone to make changes uh, with their data collection. Uh, we just made it, uh, tried to work with everyone to get that information to APHIS. Currently, right now, we have two counties in uh, quarantine. Jefferson County, which was our first uh, fine. Uh, this uh, report came in from a local person who had attended an OSU Extension Office uh, seminar on spotted lanternfly. Uh, reported it to us, uh, and uh, we followed up on it. We I called all my cooperators, 
Uh, we ended up having about 20 people uh, in the uh, survey in that area. We were able to isolate the uh, infestation to about a four acre area uh, along a major highway and railroad. Uh, we did come to find out that the railroad line there that uh, came into the town of Mingo Junction uh, was a short line, but it was connected to Norfolk and Southern. And every day, uh, trains would come in with uh, what we call a trash train, came in every day and delivered uh, trash from the East Coast to a landfill there in Jefferson County. So this train uh, has about 200 units uh, a day, 200 to 250 units a day that uh, brought in at least 63 cubic yard of trash from the East Coast. It came in, one train load uh, would come in every day. So uh, it was, it's a constant battle in this area uh, to keep spotted liner fly out when we've got this much train traffic coming in uh, from the other infested areas. But we ended up doing a treatment in that area this past summer. We hit it three times. Uh, we hit it at uh, about the second NSTAR stage came back, hit it again at the fourth NSTAR stage, and then came back at the peak of uh, adult emergence for the third time. Uh, we went back this fall, did an egg mass survey, found one tree uh, in the treatment area, on the edge of the treatment area that had uh, some egg masses on, but everything else was clean. So I, it wasn't 100% uh, successful, and uh, we're not sure, you know, if that uh, adult that came may have come in late after the treatments and, and laid the egg masses. So it, it's hard to tell with the train traffic that comes through Mingo Junction. Uh, we got two sites up in Cuyahoga County. This is um, Cleveland, Ohio area. We, well, we got three sites now up there. Two of them were reported early. Uh, they were reported by a tree surface company that was trimming trees along power lines along the railroad tracks in Eastern Cleveland. And uh, we went up and did surveys there, uh, found the egg masses, uh, or found the adults uh, quite a bit. Uh, had a problem with uh, the train track being elevated. Uh, one was beside a, a cemetery. Uh, and trying to find the, the uh, proper people to talk to about getting on the, the cemetery property to do treatments took a little while. Uh, it was a very old cemetery, so uh, we didn't know for sure who, who was operating it, but uh, we were able to later in the season go in there and do uh, some uh, oil treatments on the egg masses along that area. Uh, a second uh, spot on the east side of Cleveland was next to a um, ice cream factory. The connection between those two uh, sites is a railroad uh, that connected and ran right by both of those locations. We were able to get into that one with a treatment with bifenthrin. Uh, we came back, we aren't we got reported late, so we really didn't get to do uh, more than just the one treatment this year there, but we went back uh, and evaluated afterwards about a month or so later, and we could not find any egg masses or adults at that time. So we feel pretty com pretty good about it. We will go back again and, and look uh, and uh, ev evaluate it again this summer or this spring again. Uh, a third site up in Cuyahoga County on the west side of Cleveland. This was reported by an individual who worked at a factory um, that made plastic moldings. Uh, this site, there was no real railroad close to the facility, so I'm thinking this one might have been brought in by uh, truck traffic, bringing supplies into this uh, factory. So. Uh, we did do a uh, oil treatment on this area. This area covered about an acre, acre and a half uh, 
that we found the uh, egg masses on. We are planning to go back and do a treatment with uh, bifenthrin this summer at this location, basically do it the same way we did on um, the Mingo Junction location. Uh, we've gone out and surveyed out at least a uh, half quarter mile to a third of a mile out from this facility. And again, we were able to just isolate it around this single property. So we feel good about that. Now, recently we had a call from a uh, local arborist in Lorraine County, which is the first county west of Cleveland. Uh, this was just last week. Uh, we were up there and surveying this area. Uh, again, it was a railroad track that uh, is basically the culprit. Uh, we surveyed about two miles of track and again, only found egg masses in one small area and we ended up scraping those off. Uh, continued surveying in that area this week. Uh, we did find a few more egg masses, uh, but they were higher up. Uh, unable to scrape. So I'm going to be going up there next week and, and doing some oil treatments on those egg masses. But we scraped off about 40 egg masses in that area. Uh, and we've got about oh, 10 to 15 new egg masses that were just discovered earlier this week on, on a second round of surveys. So we'll be going back up to that area. So um, Again, we're, we're going to be setting a lot of traps this year. Uh, we're concentrating on the northeast quadrant of Ohio, about 22 counties up in northeast Ohio. We are expanding that uh, to the south a little bit since the discovery of the uh, spotted lanternfly in uh, Virginia along 77. Uh, that runs up through Ohio, so we're going to start out in Marietta, Washington County and start setting traps there to uh, detect anything that may come up the interstate on that. But uh, we're going to concentrate again on that northeast quadrant uh, of truck stops and rest stops and uh, any uh, rail sightings that we can get permission to get on. So that's what we've got going on here in Ohio. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I appreciate that update and, and information. Uh, I don't see any questions right now in the chat or the Q&A, but thank you. I appreciate it. So next we have from the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, uh, James Watson. Uh, James is the spotted fly coordinator for uh, the West Virginia Department of Agriculture, um, and he is hailing us from uh, Fairmont County, that does not have, which does not have spotted lanternfly at the moment. So, welcome, James. Thank you. I'm working on getting my screen shared here so everybody can see it. Can anybody? Can you see my? Can you see my screen? Yes, it's in. We can see it's in presenter view. Okay, great. So you can see um, the map of West Virginia. No, it's actually it's actually yeah. We just see the slide sorter right now. Okay, let me. What about now? Now that same thing. We don't, yeah, we don't, it's not in present. It's not in uh, presentation mode. How about now? <laughs> yes. All right, excellent. Perfect. All right, so I got to keep on track here because I only got 15 minutes. <laughs> I have a bunch of stuff I want to try to cover here. All right, so this map here shows currently our positive counties uh, in West Virginia where we have spotted lantern fly. We still have it uh, only in uh, that we know of in four counties. Those are Berkeley, Jefferson, Mineral, uh, and Hampshire counties, all in what we refer to as our Eastern Panhandle. Um, we do have, we have had sightings of lanternfly in other areas of the state. Um, however, 
uh, after significant visual surveys uh, in the areas surrounding where those uh, sightings were, um, you know, we have not found any existing uh, population. So our northern panhandle, we know it's kind of under attack up there, as was just discussed in the previous presentation, um, but so far, so far nothing. Um, while I'm on this map right here, I'll point out some other things. Um, you know, we we also know about the infestation that's down there bottom uh, below our state there in you know, Whitesville, Virginia. Um, so although we have been recently focusing our trapping efforts and our visual surveys in the two northern panhandles and northern West Virginia, um, we're really ramping things up there in the southern part of our state, uh, especially around truck stops. Um, there on I-77 coming out of, of Virginia. So constantly changing uh, our methodology here as to where we want to focus uh, and so forth. All right, moving on here. So again, this shows you our uh, areas where we have completed the surveys primarily in 2021. Um, and there's some statistics over here on this slide that I'm not gonna uh, read through, but again, you know, primary focus where we believe there may be a population that we are unaware of. Um, again, we're gonna be moving this further south and focusing a little bit more along highways. Um, I'm not saying, you know, when I make this next comment, I'm not saying that our railroads are an issue, but really in West Virginia, what we have noticed is our population uh, is really spreading along our interstate highways. Um, and so it's really important that we get the sprays along our highways and you know, the traps at good locations near highways. Uh, this shows the locations of our circle traps uh, in 2021. We had 53 sites in 15 counties. Um, we're going to be expanding this uh, in 2022. Again, coming down Interstate 79 there, as you can see in the graphic, uh, and really, really focusing down there around truck stops near I-77 and uh, increasing the number of traps over here. Uh, there's a lot of industry along the Ohio River. So between Parkersburg and Wheeling, especially, we'll be increasing the traps we have over there. Um, in uh, the east central part of West Virginia here, um, I'm not sure if people can see my cursor when I'm moving it or not, um, but there's not a lot of tree of heaven in those counties. Um, so it's we are going to try to focus a couple traps in some high um, traffic areas in those counties where there are some tree of heaven. Um, namely, for example, Elkins, West Virginia. Um, so the idea is if there are you know, lantern fly being moved through there, uh, we'll be able to catch them you know, in those high traffic areas, in those isolated populations of, of Tree of Heaven. I have sticky bands on here. We had 20 sites in nine counties in 2021. Uh, due to moving away from the use of sticky bands, we'll have significantly less use of those in 2022. Our lantern fly treatments 2021. Um, here's the process that we follow. Um, so first, prior to uh, implementing our treatments, we uh, have landowners fill out a release form or give us consent to treat on their property. Um, and then the next thing we do is we complete inventory of tree of heaven on the properties. This is all within a quarter mile radius of where uh, a, we've had a positive a survey for spotted lanternfly. Um, and then once we get the tree habit inventory completed, we apply uh, talic product, um, transtect, and on as insecticides on the tree of heaven. Um, and then we use Pathfinder uh, for tree heaven that are smaller than uh, six inches in DBH. Um, thus far, we have not really seen a need to use a lot of bifenthrin or talic. Um, our numbers just really aren't high enough in the areas that we have spotted lanternfly populations. So primarily we are using the Transtech product for our insecticide. Um, and then uh, similarly, golden pest spray oil, we've used that on egg masses some in the winter, um, but not really a lot. Um, due to our weather conditions that we've had here through the winter and a number of other factors, uh, we have found that Smashing and scraping the, the egg masses has been more, much more 
efficient means of controlling the egg masses than using the golden test spray oil. So that's kind of for us, that's just kind of due to weather. Um, it's due to the protocols of use for the golden pest spray oil. And also it's due to the terrain that we have here in West Virginia. Um, it really makes the golden pest spray oil really difficult to try to apply, but it's not difficult to get out there and smash, egg, smash up the egg masses. So um, that could change, you know, especially as the population appears in other parts of West Virginia where the terrain's a little bit different and the, even the weather conditions are you know, milder through the winter, such as the Charleston Huntington area, for example, should we get, you know, lantern fly down in those regions. So changing like the rest of our protocols. <clears throat> um, and as of 2021 in November, uh, we had treated 2,779 acres of tree heaven with either pesticides, with, with either insecticides or uh, herbicides. So um, the way we've, we've worked on this is that we have taken over as, as a state agency, uh, Mineral County and Hampshire County, and then Berkeley and Jefferson counties. Uh, APHIS PPQ has been working on. And this number here, this value, the combination of all the counties, uh, those treatments completed by West Virginia Department of Agriculture, as well as APHIS PPQ. We've had opportunity to do numerous outreach uh, activities. Um, I've traveled extensively in Northern Panhandle, uh, personally providing outreach materials to numerous gas stations, um, you know, other businesses where there's a lot of traffic uh, moving through, um, and then any businesses really that sell outdoor products. We had one instance without naming the company where some pellets were delivered um, and there were dead lantern flies inside the, the plastic wrap. Um, so that a good example is why we really need to focus on you know outdoor products and those facilities that sell those outdoor products uh, we've had opportunity to give several presentations uh, about spotted lantern fly and the importance of mitigating it in west virginia to agencies such as west virginia department of highways um, and then we've had opportunity um, in 2021 to assist joe Pensies with Otis Lab with circle trap comparisons to look to see, um, you know, with how many insects of lantern fly were present on traps on black walnut versus tree of heaven. That was completed in Berkeley County there in the end of our eastern panhandle. Um, we also set up sentinel tub, tra tub traps in Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan counties, uh, assisting Paul Lewis with that. And then here's a picture of our one of our outreach materials. So we developed lots of outreach materials again, um, you know, so we could reach a wide variety of, of audiences. You know, and you, the cards are really efficient. We find for when you're out and you, you encounter like a lawn lawn care business, they can stick that card in their pocket, put it in their in their vehicle. If they see something that looks suspicious, they can whip that out and look at the card and, and the insect uh, and see if that's what they are looking at. Um, you know, it's not large, it's not something they have to have difficulty in, you know, carrying around with them on the job, essentially. So 2022 treatments so far. Um, our priority again has been uh, smashing up the egg masses. We've seen a, a lot of egg masses on beneath the bark on dead ash and dead elm trees. Um, that was something that we really just discovered this year, and I don't really think that was a known fact previously. So we were excited to find, you know, that find this out and realize we're probably getting a lot more egg masses this year compared to last year. Um, again, using some golden pest spray oil, but smashing egg masses is definitely more, it's proven more efficient for us. Um, we've also been working a lot on tree heaven inventories, especially in the last two weeks, year up for our treatment season here uh, in spring. So what do we have planned for 2022? Well, I'll just start by saying that we're gonna be, as the population spreads, we're gonna be increasingly forced to prioritize uh, which parcels receive treatments and which parcels do not. Um, in our areas of uh, population. 
we will continue with uh, herb herbicide insecticide treatments um, just with increased prioritization due to increasing spread of the insect. Um, we will especially focus on our surveys in Northern Panhandle and in that I-77 corridor in Southern West Virginia. Uh, our, our trapping protocols will be similar to what I've discussed in 2021, with the exceptions of, you know, the removal of the sticky bands and moving our trapping efforts more um, along the Ohio River and then in that I-77 corridor there in Southern West Virginia. Um, we're gonna be focusing on hospitality industry, um, nurseries, and of course, agricultural industry. And our message is really gonna be, don't bring SLF back with you. You don't want spotted lanternfly. And then this is why you don't want spotted lanternfly. You know, do it for yourself. I mean, this is the harm that can cause your business, your property. Um, and this is what you can do to not have that um, occur and um, continue to provide resources to landowners um, for control strategies. So thus far, a lot of our outreach materials have focused on not bringing the lanternfly to your, to West Virginia or to areas where we don't have the lanternfly, um, but not so much on what to do if you have an infestation of lanternfly. And so now we're at that point where we are getting some areas that are starting to get the numbers of lantern fly up uh, where people are starting to notice it a little bit. And so, you know, eventually we, some of those areas could get to the point where landowners are really wondering how they can control it. Um, and so we're gonna, I've created literature and we're gonna work on distributing that literature, those individuals a little bit more detailed. Um, and it really goes into depth on what you as a landowner can do should you have an infestation of lanternfly? Uh, because, you know, we can get folks on board to help us with this mitigation effort that really um, helps curtail this in our state. It, it's a lot, everyone working together is a lot more than just us working alone, is essentially what I'm trying to say there. Um, also, we will continue to collaborate with other agencies. Um, more, just more recently, uh, we have discussed some really awesome uh, biocontrol study and work uh, with the Appalachian Fruit Research Laboratory, Tracy Lesky in Kernsville, West Virginia. And so, um, for example, there's a lot of discussion you know, about verticillium, even on our agenda, and whether or not we have that in West Virginia. I believe we do have that currently present in West Virginia. And, you know, some of these biocontrol efforts look really, really promising. Um, you know, more environmentally friendly and quite promising in terms of controlling tree heaven on the landscape and the lanternfly population uh, specifically. And so this map here, I threw it in here. Most of you probably are familiar with this map already and have seen it a lot. But again, I wanted to point this out mostly in the sense that in our state, you can see here where, you know, we really see these uh, populations moving along these highway corridors. All right, looks like I'm almost out of time. I made it. <laughs> questions? Yeah, James, there's a few questions in the in the Q and A. Um, what are tub traps? You mentioned tub traps in your presentation. What are tub traps? Is the question? Well, that's an example where of, of where a picture is worth a thousand words, um, <laughs> but. In contrast to our circle trap, which I should have put a picture of our circle trap on there, I guess. Um, you just imagine that the tub trap is like a, an area where insects would get trapped in. Um, it's kind of like a pipe that's half cut off. And maybe I can put a link to a picture of it in the, in the chat here, if I can find the chat. Um, yeah, that probably would be good. And then there's two more uh, questions, James, if you could just go into the Q&A and and maybe type in your answers for those so we can stay on time. Sure, ab absolutely. I'll put that link in there to the, the tub trap. So like I said, picture's worth a thousand words. And I'll even put, try to get a picture of the circle trap in there as well. Absolutely. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay.
Our next speaker is uh, Megan Abraham. She is the Director of Entomology and Plant Pathology at the Indiana Department of Natural Resources. Um, and of course, Indiana is uh, one of the newer uh, comers to the uh, spider lanternfly group. So welcome, Megan. Thanks. Let me just make sure I can, you guys can see my screen here. Are we in the right place? Yes, we can see it. All right. Oh, says, okay. Well, this is Spotted Lanternfly 101. Is that what you're trying to show? Nope, but it's the same, pretty much, it's pretty close. Okay. Uh, maybe, yes, it's, it's the right one. I just got the wrong name on it. You still with me? Yeah, we can see okay. it. All right, so spotted lanternfly in Indiana. We had heard from Dana in 2014 when it showed up um, and all prediction models actually told us that we wouldn't, shouldn't have to worry about it until 2032. So, um, but in the 2017, 2016, 2018 period, we noticed that it was starting to move outside of Indiana. Um, so we knew we were gonna need to start looking for it eventually. Um, so we started putting in for farm bill funding to do some, um, some surveys for it in some high risk entry areas. We, we had had some previous Megan, did we did we lose you? I can't hear you anymore, Megan. Megan. Megan, we lost sound. We lost your sound. No. How about now? Yes, I can hear you clear now. Computer doesn't like these uh, long days. It tries to go on vacation. All right, let's try this again. Can you hear me? Yep, can hear you and see it. All right, so where, how far did I get here? I think back one more slide. Yeah, right. Ish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, it starts from there. So in 2018, we started doing our surveys here for Spot Lantern Fly. Um, if I go out again, just pop back on and I'll keep an eye on that window. Um, okay. Um, we started doing surveys. We knew we had Tree of Heaven here. We had done some surveys previously that told us it was throughout our wood lots, but especially around the edges. We also knew we had a, a diverse winery production area here in Indiana. Uh, definitely not known for it, but obviously um, still important and distributed throughout our state. So we had some high risk entry ways, um, especially considering that we're the crossroads of America. If you're going anywhere in the Midwest, you gotta come through Indiana at some point. Um, and uh, we have a lot of logging, a lot of corn, soybean, camping areas. So we knew where to look and, and some of these high risk entry ways um, for other pests um, and where we might find this one as well. Um, so we started setting traps and we conducted surveys for several years with farm bill funding. Um, we've got some uh, trace forward and pathway surveys. We did a vineyard survey several years in a row. 
Um, we also did some windshield surveys when we were out looking for Downs and Cankers disease and other types of, of things that we were currently already searching for. We, we added this to the list. And of course, we inspected all of our growers every year. So we, we also looked for spotted lanternfly when we were looking at our growers. No sign of it anywhere until we got this email in July 2021 from a gentleman that lived in Switzerland County in southern Indiana saying I was out drinking my coffee this morning and looked at my walnut tree and this bug was on it. I don't think it's from here. I've never seen it before. Um, and so we immediately sent the inspector out there to take a look. This is the tree that is actually found on in Indiana. Um, and we didn't find a lot in his yard. The first time we went and visited, we didn't find much at all, actually. Um, and then the gentleman went to, for a walk in his back lot in the woods that are surrounding his property. Um, and we, um, uh, he, he realized that they were just all over the place. Um, this is an area that's not heavily traversed. Um, not very many people go back there besides the few landowners that have properties that's, that butt up to it. It's used once or twice a year for hunting or recreation purposes. Um, and it's not really well managed at this point. Um, so we head our back there and we start seeing more signs of, of the hunt the spotted lantern fly. So um, old egg cases, um, definitely a whole lot of um, sooty mold all over the place, um, bees all over the place, wasps looking for honeydew. Um, so we can tell that there's an established population, but we still don't see a whole lot of it. And it's basically because it's such a good um, insect at hiding in the surrounding area. We did Megan, we lost you again. We lost your. Oh, about now. I can hear you now. Yes. <laughs> Let me beat this computer. Last thing I do. All right. So we found out um, that in um, um, in southern Indiana, this is the, actually the homeowner's house right here off of this road um, and most of the wood lot that's infested ended up being right in here. Now VV, Indiana, where this spot is, is actually the home of the first commercial winery in the United States. Um, and they have something called the Swiss Wine Festival every year where people come in. Um, it's like a big county fair or a, um, it's a week long event with lots of vendors, lots of people coming and going. There's a great swamp. Um, but obviously wineries and vineyards are important to this community. Um, this is actually where our infested site is in comparison to Cincinnati and Louisville, which is down here in this corner. Um, not easy to get to, honestly, um, and not very much stuff around it. But there are a few things that made us wonder, okay, how did this thing get here? Um, there's a Indian reservation nearby with um, a uh, gambling there, a casino. There are a couple of steel mills and we thought, okay, well, did this material come down the river um, to these steel, steel mills and maybe that's how they showed up? Because um, this is across, across the Risk River here, this is Kentucky. Um, so that's how close it, this site is to the other next state over. Um, and then along this river, of course, there's a bunch of campgrounds uh, and that's where people come in to either re seasonally work at these still mills or they might um, just vacation there in their RVs. And so we thought, okay, well, maybe that's where I came. And we had searched all these spots and found nothing. And then we went back to the original woodlot and figured out Fido did it. Um, actually, the, one of the gentlemen that owns the property near the, the 
infestation had actually recently moved from an eastern state. He was familiar with the spotted lantern fly. Um, it was around his property when he had moved there several years previously. He knew about it because he still had family back on the east coast, um, but he had brought all of his equipment out and his RVs and set up camp here in Indiana because he liked the area. Um, we don't blame him for that, um, but um, he, and, it, and most likely he's the one that probably accidentally introduced this pest. So um, we actually had a lot of help in the last year in trying to figure out what to do next. Uh, Dana Rhodes was fantastic as well as her entire group. Uh, she sent a team out to help us. We we did a lot of question and answer with these guys. We did a lot of uh, learning about the different survey techniques. We did a lot of um, outreach type um, talk and, and we actually invited some of our partners in extension, um, our USDA partners and our state entity to all come to these meetings with these um, Pennsylvania personnel that had been working this problem for several years and, and I'm not sure how we would have done this without them. So we, we give them great thanks for that. Then let's see, they came out and they actually brought their truck with them. Um, so they showed us how they do things in Pennsylvania and what chemicals they use and how they do their surveys and how to conduct windshield surveys and visual surveys, how to find spotted and lanternfly eggs high up in trees, um, what, what things had worked for them in the past. And that was instrumental in getting us a good start because remember it was July when we found this infestation. So we had no planning period. It was straight into, okay, do what you're gonna do this year because you're, you're on, you're on. So we got a lot of help. We got a little help from the natives too. Um, some local um, horses in the area tried to help a little bit, um, but we, we got a good handle on things. So we did get this summer 400 trees treated. Um, we concentrated on some herbicide treatments for some of the lanthus that are smaller and then treated the larger trees with dinotefuron for um, making them trap trees. Um, and we got some kill. So that was a good sign that we had the right way to go. But again, this isn't an area that was easily walked through. Um, it is not maintained or managed at all. Um, and so we had some troubles getting into those areas and actually conducting these treatments. As a matter of fact, I've got one employee that broke an ankle in there this summer. Um, so, but we did get in there and figure out what was going on, or at least as far as we were able to figure out in this past summer. Um, and we will continue to go back and, and do some more treatments in future. Um, in the meantime, um, we had gotten another email from the folks in California letting us know that um, they had found a spotted lantern fly on a FedEx plane that came out of Indianapolis. Now FedEx is a hub in Indianapolis um, and they go all over the country. We have worked with this FedEx hub in the past on things like Japanese beetle. They do have excluders that they use for Japanese beetle season. Um, but remember the Japanese beetle season stops before the spotted lantern fly season does. So we asked our, for help from our USDA counterparts and they were really useful in going out and doing surveys around the airport looking for spot, spotted lantern fly and, and, or any tree of heaven um, in the area surrounding the airport. We did not find any at this point. Um, we did find out a little bit more about this particular flight. Apparently it originated on the East Coast um, and did come through Indianapolis. So there's a good chance that that spotted lantern fly got into that plane at some other point and just hadn't been found until that that um, arrival in California. And there are plenty of places on these planes that these, these little insects can find themselves that are hard to spot. So we continue to do some outreach and education with local flower and patio shows. Um, we maintain our relationships with our wineries. Um, we have a lot of industry meetings in the winter that I'm sure you all go to. Um, we take advantage of those to do some more outreach on spotted lantern fly with nursery and landscape. Um, and we do know that we have a threat there. This is our um, spotted lantern fly infested site. 
uh, all of this little area here owned by several different homeowners. There's not a lot of traffic in and out of there with the exception of the dog shows that are there, but just a mile to the south are these RV resorts. The, this is the, the golf course that we talked about. And then this um, Mar is Markland Dam and right across the river is Kentucky. So Kentucky has been fortunate in, in getting a little bit of outreach funding and they were able to put up some, some uh, signage, uh, including this um, spotted lantern fly sign on their side of the river. So that's been helpful. And we did send out pest alerts to all of the local homeowners or, or property owners. We found all their addresses and sent out letters um, to help there as well. Um, we also had some folks call into the call centers, what had been happening, I guess, on the East Coast. They were being overrun with um, some of their calls out there. and. And when you Google how to report spotted lantern fly, um, fortunately or unfortunately, our email or our email and phone number from Indiana shows up there. So some folks were getting confused and calling the wrong place, um, but we couldn't take it down in case there was some calls coming in for Indiana. We also have a weekly review that we send out once a week during the summer months to report any new pests or pathogens. Anybody can sign up for this and there's currently over 6,500 um, recipients of the meat this email that comes out once a week here in it during our summer. Um, we also are fortunate enough to have several online reporting tools here in Indiana. Um, so we can use an app to report or contact us by 866 no exotic phone number or a toll free line or an email address. Um, but right now, as it stands, we're just kind of waiting to see what happens in the future on funding. Um, we didn't qualify yet for any Goal 6 spotted lanternfly funding. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to receive some funding in, some, in either Goal 6 or some other rapid response funding. Um, we have a little bit of money that the state has put aside for treatment um, and I'll have to use my man hours here in the state, the existing man hours to do what treatment we can. Um, but I gotta tell you, that's not very much. <laughs> so um, we're just kind of waiting and holding our breaths, hoping something works out and that um, with that, um, that funding that comes out in late March, we get a piece of it. And that's about it.